I'm reading Psalm 26, a song of David. And in this song, David kind of identifies who he isn't. He says, declare me innocent, O Lord, because I do what is right and trust you completely. Examine me and test me. Lord, judge my desires and thoughts. Your constant love is my guide. Your faithfulness always leads me. I do not keep company with worthless people. I have nothing to do with hypocrites. I hate the company of the evil and avoid the wicked. Lord, I wash my hands to show that I am innocent and march in worship round your altar. I sing a hymn of thanksgiving and tell of all your wonderful deeds. I love the house where you live, O oh Lord, the place where your glory dwells. Do not destroy me with the sinners. Spare me from the feet of murderers, those who do evil all the time and are always ready to take bribes. As for me, I do what is right. Be merciful to me and save me. I am safe from all dangers when I'm in the assembly of his people. I praise the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you again this Sunday morning to worship you and seek your presence. We confess that we've not remembered you and honored you as we should this past week, but we want to do better, not just to be a Christian, but to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. We have been called to love God and to love our neighbors, and we're seeking to do that by helping our fellow man. Thank you that we've been able to help Natalia to come here from her war-torn country of Ukraine. Thank you that we are able to help Marina's sister, Ajay, to get out of the refugee camp in Uganda, to live in a safer place as she waits for the Canadian government. Thank you too for the Scripture Union people who've done so much to help her to clear the way to come to Canada, together with her four children. And we thank you for Refugee Bridge, which has helped financially and in other ways. We pray for our pastor, Michael, and the board of elders who are also seeking your will for the good of our fellowship. We reflect the words that Paul wrote, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Thank you, too, for all who signed last week to desire to be a part of the Ministry of Highlands. We pray that you will bless us, not for our own pleasure, but so that we can bless others who need to know you, whether they know it or not. We also pray for all who are serving you, both in distant lands and also locally, for Mustard Seed and Hope Mission and Gull Lake and so many more. We pray for our school children and the teachers who've struggled to get over the effects of COVID-19 and also for all older people. We pray for Kathy Thornell and Al and Sheila Loosley, who've had to give up their homes. We pray for all homeless people. We thank you for the young families who are now involved in our fellowship and for the little ones who try to stump Michael with their mystery suitcase. Thank you, too, for the birth of Isaac and Catherine's baby boy. 
we close with the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this glorious day. Lord, as I pray here, I hear birds chirping outside and are reminded that your eye is on the sparrow. And that, uh, Lord, how much more worthy are we to you than a, a bird? And yet you promise to take care of us even more than that. Lord, for those who are in need of your provision, Lord, may they be comforted by that fact. Lord, I ask that you would, uh, that you would speak through me. It'd be your words, not mine. And everyone would come away having heard you and know that they are loved. Amen. So I have a confession to make. I was at the Garth Brooks concert last night, but not in the good way. I was flipping burgers. And uh, I think I made 800 hamburgers. So, and I got out really late. So I'm feeling fatigued. <laughs> and my goodness, Garth Brook fans sure can eat and, uh, and drink. <laughs> there was a fellow who was working with us and he's a doctor. And he's like, you can't do this. <laughs> he's like, well, on second thought, you're keeping me employed. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I also wanted just to say a shout out to all the folks who are on Zoom. And uh, I just want to say I miss you guys and I wish uh, we'd be able to see each other in person. Um, but I recognize there are certain logistics that are making it impossible for you to hear. But please know that you are loved and you are missed. And we look forward to when we can all gather together uh, in person. Also, uh, with the soup and sandwich, uh, next week, please remember to bring sandwiches, okay? And there will be an optional soup because Brady doesn't like borscht. <laughs> like someone needs to move out of Edmund Chuck. <laughs> Let's pray for him. <laughs> You'll eat it. He won't have it yet. You can do the missionary prayer that I used when I was in Africa and people would serve me exotic foods. And I would say, Lord, I'll get it down if you keep it down. <laughs> Who do you identify with? That's a question that's asked a lot today, isn't it? And our whole political system has been overrun by this. Who do you identify with? And it's interesting, as, as far as we can say, hey, we've, we've grown and we've evolved as a society. In actuality, the whole identity thing is really returning to tribalism. Who, who's in my tribe and who's in the other tribe? And it manifests itself in very unique ways. And I mean, as we're seeing, I mean, we live in the age of identity politics. And please keep in mind, I wrote this sermon not realizing the decisions that were going to be made to our brothers in the South. All right. This is what the Lord put on my plate a couple of weeks ago, and I wrote it. And then it, I think it's just very interesting, the timing of this. But how do we as Christians not get sucked up into identity politics? And uh, it's an unfortunate because identity politics happens because it works, unfortunately but I don't think it actually creates a good thing. And as I said, it, it, it manifests itself in weird ways. My, my parents, they're from BC, and they love coming to Alberta, and particularly there's products at the Costco in Alberta that you can't get in BC, all right? 
And so my parents often like to stock up and they were going through this line and uh, they were getting, okay, I'll, I'll confess it was the margarita mix uh, that they have at Costco, okay? And um, my mom was born in Tucson, Arizona, okay? Yeah, she's, she likes going to Margaritaville sometimes. Anyways, she, she's in line and my dad says, oh, this is fantastic. You can't get this in BC, right? And all of a sudden, it was like quietness in Costco. And this is when the whole pipeline issue was going on with BC and we were boycotting. And, and there was just like this uncomfortable thing. And then my dad, without missing a beat, yells, but I'm pro-pipeline. <laughs> and then everyone's like, oh, okay, all right, all right, all right, you know? But it was like immediately clear that who was in and who was out, and he was out because he was from BC uh, and so on. So who do you identify with? Marxist, capitalist, socialist, feminist, egalitarian, complementarian, post-millennial, Millennial, goodness gracious, right? So where does you, you, your being a Christian fit with these identifications? Are you a socialist Christian or a Christian socialist? A conservative Christian or a Christian conservative? You know, the crazy thing is that those are different groups. <laughs> but it really doesn't matter. And it gets really messy. And Tony Campolo brilliantly put it this way. Mixing politics and religion is like mixing ice cream and manure. It doesn't really affect the manure much, but it really messes up the ice cream. <laughs> That's gross. Well, then don't do it. <laughs> Christianity is Christianity. Let us not, uh, let us follow Christ. Let us not let it be uh, hitchhiked by other political agendas and other isms. Because those isms are after the Christian vote simply because they want to get elected. And I would suggest that Christians are after doing the right thing because Jesus said so. And Jesus said, love your neighbor. Professor John Hatt is a, the Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership at the New York University of Stern School of Business. It's quite a title. And he defines identity politics this way. It's based on the Bedouin motion, me against my brother, me and my brother against our cousin, me, my brother and cousin against the stranger. It's a very general principle of social psychology. If you try to unite people, let's all unite against them. They're the bad people. They're the cause of the problem. Let's all stick together. Isn't that just scapegoating? Let's find who's the problem. Let's identify the problem and let's all gang up against that problem. And if we can root out that problem, then we are good. And then after we've rooted out that one, we'll realize we still have problems. So we'll look for another group to identify as our problem and we'll all gang up on them. Yet, Jesus says, you've heard it, that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. COVID has been a very interesting season. And watching the church and Christian leaders uh, take advantage of that situation and trying to identify groups that they are against and saying, well, you're the problem. And they, I'm going to get in trouble here. I really struggle and have, just say it. Christianity, following Christ, is not about your own personal rights. It's about self-sacrifice and, and surrendering to the lordship of the Jesus Christ, period. Okay? And when I see a church 
who in their sanctuary, going into the sanctuary on a wall inside their building, the main entrance, and a big frame picture is the Canadian Charter of Rights. I go, what? I thought uh, scripture was our authority, not the Canadian Charter of Rights. I thought we worship Christ because of what Christ did on the cross, how he defeated the power of sin and death for us, not because the Charter of Rights allows freedom of religion. That is why we gather together. And if, how different would it have been if the community that was not happy with the COVID restrictions, instead of um, creating interesting narratives, I'll put it that way, against those that they disagree with, what if we prayed for those that we disagreed with? What if we actually put the Christ into Christian <laughs> and followed what he said? It's really unfortunate because it's even gotten caught, it's caught up in, into our own, within our pastors, within the Baptist Union. I'm staking out different grounds. And it's interesting how, unfortunately, issues are becoming more important than the fact that we all love Jesus and we all believe that Jesus is Lord. And when the identity politics gets so big, it's, it, it, it's shocking to me when people say, well, it's not enough that we all believe in Jesus. And I'm like, no, no, it is enough. And it's that common ground that's going to make it so that I can love you because I think you're crazy. <laughs> Reminds me of a, a story of a, a fellow who became a Christian and he came from a rough background and he was telling the guys at work you know, uh, you know, that he'd become a Christian. I said, oh, really? What has Christ ever done, you know, to make a difference in your life? And he said, well, Christ right now is stopping me from punching you in the nose. The church is not immune to this. And I've discovered it all depends where you are. I have a, um, a, a, a colorful background in churches. I, I've, I've worked in the United Church. I worked in the Lutheran and Baptist. And whatever denomination I'm in, I always get labeled differently. When I was in the United Church, I was the raving conservative evangelical that spoke too much about Jesus. <laughs> when I was in the Lutheran Church, uh, they said, well, what your job as youth pastors, we want you to make little Lutherans. And I said, well, how about little Christians? <laughs> Uh, in the Baptist church, I'm labeled the progressive that talks too much about Jesus. <laughs> I don't think I change. And yet we get so caught up in this. I thought Jesus, Jesus is enough. If he, Jesus is the Lord of the church and he's called us all, all together, then surely he's able to hold it all together. Isms want us to believe that if you commit wholeheartedly with their isms uh, and you join them in rooting out whatever ism is the enemy, you will bring salvation to the world. When I uh, was in Kiev years ago and seeing all the remnants of the Soviet Empire, and originally I wanted to grab some of those cool souvenirs and then i heard the stories of the soviet empire and then i was like i want to have nothing to do with that but these symbols and that were all around there and this idea of this world revolution and trying to get everyone to buy in and if everyone would buy in then it would work and we would have salvation but isn't that jesus's job he's the one that's to bring salvation he's the one who has brought about salvation, he's the one that will return and bring everything to conclusion. So let us be very clear that uh, <laughs> if someone asks you, who do you identify with? Please for, say Jesus. And they'll look at you funny, which will create a great opportunity. <laughs> well, what do you mean by that? Because one thing that I've discovered about Jesus Jesus isn't about the agenda. He is about the person. And when you enter into a relationship with that person, how he responds is going to be different and how we respond. Jesus already has a plan for salvation. 
He already finished that plan for salvation. He did what we could not do, entered into death, the penalty of sin, and to defeat it, so that all who would believe in him might experience resurrection, might experience forgiveness, might experience new life. Let us not add more to it. And if you're looking for a spoiler of the final solution, oh, bad, 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 sorry, the final answer. Uh, that was a slip of the tongue. As I said, I'm tired from the, <laughs> the concession. Read Revelations 21, 22, where everything has been restored. No more crying, no more mourning. All these things that all these different isms and identity politics wants to say, if we can get everyone to buy in, it will be a perfect world. It's like, well, actually, no, if we could all just buy into Jesus, it will be a perfect world. May I suggest that instead of putting our hopes on getting the right person elected, we pray, Lord Jesus, come. May I recommend that you pray for those who persecute you rather than scapegoating as a group as your enemy. Psalm 72 is such a prayer. This psalm was prayed in the hope of Israel's kings to rule as intended with justice and righteousness. But as with any reading of the historical books in the Bible, you will see that the kings of Israel failed time and time again. The Old Testament is a wonderful expose on humanity trying to solve the world. And it always failing. God declaring what he wants them to do. He asking them walk in righteousness and justice and mercy and love. And the kings continually disappointed. If anything, the, uh, for me, the inspiration of the Old Testament was uh, evidence to show you how not to do it. And also revealing why we needed God to show up. Why we needed help. That despite our best efforts, we couldn't do it. And nothing has changed. <laughs> the kingdoms have, have changed, but the titles and the positions are the same. And all these different leaders uh, are saying, well, if you just vote for me, I will solve all your problems. Maybe the problems that we have are beyond that. Maybe they are relational within God and us. And we need to get right with God before we can get right with our neighbor. And so it's so beautiful. John 1, 14, in the beginning of John's gospel, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. God, the one who spoke creation into being, said, let there be light. Who said, let's make man and woman in our image. He said, you know what? I need to come down in flesh and blood to show them how it's done. Listen to the Sermon on the Mount. How many times does Jesus say, you've heard it said, but I tell you this. This is the truth. So we need to pray in anticipation that he will come back. We need to pray in anticipation that he'll give us what we need so that we can be reflections of who he is. We need to stay the course of our hope in Christ and not get sidetracked. So let's pray Psalm 72. I'm going to read it aloud, and I just invite you just to quiet yourself and listen to that and the imagery that comes to mind. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. Keep in mind the oppressor is Satan. And as Paul said, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers. 
May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. May he be like rain falling on mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days, may the righteous flourish and the prosperity abound till the moon is no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him with gifts. May all the kings bow down to him and all the nations serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out. The afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence. For precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold from Shiva be given to him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. May corn abound through the land on the tops of the hills. May it sway. May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all the nations will be, will be blessed through him. And they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with this glory. Amen and amen. Until this hope is realized. We're in this wonderful situation. It is and it isn't. It is, but it will be. That Jesus is on his throne. I just spent a whole lot unpacking revelations, declaring that Jesus is on his throne, even though it's craziness in the world right now. And he is going to bring about restoration for all. But until then, if we are going to pray and ask that God be like what we, that Psalm 72, then we need to act in the line with the characteristics that we are asking God to do. This is a quote from one of my preaching commentaries. We must, in the spirit of the coming king, live lives of righteousness, justice, and peace. God expects men and women will respond by building their lives around those qualities which the new king has come to proclaim. And if we think back to our original calling and identity, we are created in the image of God to be image bearers, um, to be like uh, viceroys, ambassadors to God's world. How much more now that we have encountered the power and the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we've been transformed to reflect him to the rest of the world. We are not called to sit on the pine and complain about the world and say the world's going to hell and I'm just going to sit here and be sour about it. No, we are called to be salt to the world. To be light to the world. We become who we identify with. One cannot honestly pray Psalm 72 without being willing to build our lives around Christ, the one with whom you identify. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I ask again, who do you identify with? Let us shake off the culture of identity politics and embrace the identity of Christ. Let us become like Christ so the world can see Christ through us. 1 Peter 2.19, our calling is this. But we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light.
never stop to realize that you are a royal priesthood? I'm just the shepherd. <laughs> My job is to equip you to carry on being priests to the world. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. I love it when Jesus is incredibly clear. You can't really debate that one. What was the new commandment that Jesus gave? Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Where is the whole identifying the enemy in that so that we can gang up against them? Nope. It gets even crazier. Jesus forgave those that identified against him. We should do so likely. Rather than embracing these paths of identity politics, let us embrace the path of Christ. Love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Friends, this is our calling. I pray that the Holy Spirit would give you the strength to be able to, you have the wisdom to be able to see when you're getting pulled into the ism or identity politics and be a, 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 not a, a moment of failure, but a moment of saying, hey, Lord, thank you for revealing that to me. I'm going to just recenter and realign right now. Because at the end of the day, all these identity politics and these isms will go away and the last one standing will quite literally be the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to stand with him. So friends, the next time you're asked, who do you identify with? I'm say Jesus. And the most unique thing I find about that answer with everyone that I've ever given that answer to, everyone likes Jesus. Sometimes they don't really like the church. <laughs> but they really like Jesus. So why don't we play to our strengths and focus on Jesus? And if someone says, well, what about the church? It says, well, we're a mess, but we trust that Jesus is going to sort it out. And my goal right now is to identify with Christ so that I can become like him. Amen. Amen.